All right, thanks, Gersh. All right, um, I'm preaching on salt and light this morning. Um, I wanted to encourage us by reminding us uh, what the Bible tells us we should be in this world. You know, so we know from Matthew 5, this is a part of the passage that I'm focusing on this morning in Matthew 5. It says here in verse 13, Ye are the salt of the earth. So that's one of the things that Christ has called us to be, or well, that we are, right? And the question is, are we going to heed that calling of what we are as believers? Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. And here's the second thing that we are and should be. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So we see two concepts here, salt and light. And today we're going to talk about uh, what that salt and that light represents and um, how we can be salty as Christians, you know, and how we can be brighter Christians uh, for the Lord. So let's firstly talk about salt. What is this spiritual salt? Well, when we uh, look at verse uh, Mark 9, it says here, Salt is good, but if the salt hath lost his saltness, wherewith will ye season it? Look at this. Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. So we know that salt in the Bible is representative of truth, right? And the Bible is saying that in order for us to be salt that is good, we need to have salt in ourselves to be a good salt that is salt of the earth, right? So not only are we the salt of the earth in the sense that Christians with truth in them are scattered everywhere, giving truth and, I guess, flavor to the world, but in order to be useful salt, the Bible talks about having salt in yourself. So it's interesting there that the flavor of the salt is also salt being in the salt, which is salt throughout the world. Um, look at Colossians 4. It says here, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. And this is a verse that I always think about just when we speak with other people. Right? A lot of people that you know, come across truth and they learn a lot of things and they want to share that knowledge with other people. Maybe they just recently come across it. You know, sometimes when you recently come across something, you're very excited about it. It makes a lot of sense to you and you just don't understand why it doesn't make sense to anyone else. And anyone that just doesn't see it the way you see it, they're an idiot, they're, you know, they're, they're stupid. But this is how people sometimes think. But this, this is a sign of spiritual immaturity, guys. You know, because yes, you can be excited about something, you can know what you believe, you can know that it's true, but a sign of spiritual maturity is also how we then communicate that to other people, right? And it's interesting here that the Bible says here, let your speech be always with grace. So grace, right, is, is the key hallmark of a way a Christian speaks. And if you think about grace, it's like, all right, giving the person the benefit of the doubt, having some grace with them that you know, they might not get it straight away, giving them the grace that they may take some time to come to the conclusions that you have come and not treating them in a way that, you know, they, they don't get it or, you know, they're not awake or whatever. Like, you know, there, were time, there was a time when we weren't awake, right? There was a time when we didn't get it. And that's what grace is. Grace is, you know, you love the person enough to help them come to an understanding. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know, you may know how to how you ought to answer every man. So it's, it, I love this analogy that, you know, the way we want our speech to come across to other people, we want to think about, you know, it's like preparing them a meal. You know, like if you were to cook something for somebody, you, you taste it and you want, you know, I want this to be appetizing if I'm going to serve it to somebody. And if you think about salt in this equation of this analogy of food, you know, a little bit of salt can make food taste very good. Not enough salt and it's like bland, right? But then too much salt, it starts to taste really bad. And if you think about it, if you just gave somebody an excess amount of salt, it, salt can eventually become toxic, right? So, so think about this, it, it, and it fits so well, that analogy of food and salt, when you're talking with people. Because when we reflect back 
on times where we may have given somebody so much truth to the point they don't even want to talk about it anymore. They don't even want anything to do with it. They're just like, you know, where they're bitter against it or whatnot. We don't want to give so much salt in our food that it's, it's toxic to somebody else. You know, we, we want to preach the truth, but we want to preach it with love. We want to preach it with grace so that it's something that is appetizing to the other person. Now, obviously, we try our best to make it appetizing. Even something that's appetizing is not necessarily liked by other people, but that is the mindset we ought to have. And you can see here, this is the truth that is seasoned amongst what we speak about so that we, this is the way we ought to speak with other people. Now, think about some properties of salt. You know, we're salt of the world. We want to have salt in ourselves. What are some properties of salt where we can look at that property of salt in the physical world and apply it to us spiritually? Well, one is that salt preserves, doesn't it? Jude 1, we see here, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. So we know that when people have salt within themselves and then we share you know, that salt with other people, that if they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they believe on that truth, the Word of God, then they get saved and they will remain saved because it's everlasting life. And salt does the same thing. If, if anyone knows anything about preservation or about fermentation you know you use brine in it and brine is a, a salt solution right it's basically water and salt to help preserve things now not only does salt preserve things and we can liken that to people getting saved people staying saved um, salt also has antibacterial properties you know when people you know they go for surgery in their mouth or whatever and they, they you say rinse it with salt water it's trying to kill the bacteria in your mouth and truth has that same effect right to get rid of you know false doctrine you know bad influences you know in Matthew 22 29 look what Jesus says here Jesus answered and said unto them you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. So you say that if you don't have that salt in yourself, not only are you not going to help others from refraining from error, but you yourself may get into error because of the lack of salt in you. And uh, you know, salt has that property even in the physical world. Thinking back as well to how we talk and uh, having our you know grace always, uh, our speech always with grace seasoned with salt. You know, you got to think as well, salt not only is used to flavor things, but have you ever tried to clean things with salt? You know, people put salt onto something, you know, you rub it with lemon, ask them to sort of uh, clean things. So salt can be an abrasive as well. Look at what it says here in 1 Peter 4. It can be an abrasive. So some people may not like the salt that we have. Beloved, think it not strange. So he's saying it's not weird, it's, just, it's not out of place. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part... He is glorified. So salt is an abrasive, just like the truth can be abrasive to people. But sometimes you've got the opposite of that, where sometimes that, that truth is needed to clean people up, right? Where it's to clean off those impurities. And, you know, like we talked about with our speech, with grace always seasoned with salt, that that salt can be there too, not only so that they will receive it, but it also helps correct people and things like that but we also always have to do it with love and with grace so yes it can get people upset but sometimes it's also necessary to clean people up as well and we already talked about this in terms of food but you know obviously salt is used to make things nicer to make things taste nicer and you know how does that how do I see that working in a spiritual way is you know the more Christians there are in the world, the more people, the more salt there is in the world, the more salt we have in ourselves, the more pleasant this world is going to be. I mean, look at Titus 2. I mean, look at what the Bible's telling us to be in terms of as Christians. to speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. I mean, that, that already. I mean, I've never thought of this one, but I mean, wouldn't it be a better place already in the world if people just made sense? 
Do you know what I mean? Like, if people just spoke with sense and spoke with sound doctrine, I mean, you wouldn't be getting all this, you know, you could be a boy one day and a girl the other day and a boy one day. There's gender fluidity and all these different genders that are out there. But, you know, just, uh, just the, the nonsensical stuff that happens in our world. I mean, if people, you know, spoke the things that would become sound doctrine, that would be a, an awesome place to live. Let the aged men be sober, sober, grave, you know, serious, some seriousness about us, temperate. What's that? Discipline, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. You know, it's, you know that it's it, first and foremost, isn't it interesting that the first thing he addresses is the aged men. Why? Because the aged men are meant to be the leaders in a society, right? The older people setting the example. But, but what do we see in our society today? The older people, they, they are giving up. They're saying they've done their time and they all want to they want to retire and do this and take it easy while our country goes to hell. You know, but you know, the aged men are meant to be leading the example, sound in faith, in charity and patience. They're temperate, they're disciplined, right? They're consistently serving the Lord up until, like, like Paul said, he finished his course with joy. The aged women, likewise, right? So in the same way. So there's a way that we ought to behave as Christians, right? Where we behave respectably and we speak respectably, we dress respectably. Like we want to look different to the world. And we can see here that, you know, we want the aged men and the aged women to, to lead by example, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Man, if we had this sort of society where, where women embrace their role and men embrace their role, we'd have strong families. It'd be such a, a much better place to live, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. I mean, this is uh, sort of hearkening to the, the rampant fornication that happens in our society and, and women, you know, just flaunting their body and, and, and promoting this sort of society. You know, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise, right? Likewise what? Likewise be like the older men, right? Likewise in, in what? He's telling everyone else to be sober and grave and to act in a in a certain way. So some people think, well, it's because I'm, I'm young, I've got an excuse to behave like a child. I've got an excuse to be irresponsible. But no, the, the Bible here is exhorting young men also to behave like the older men, just like the older women are to teach the younger women how to behave like the older women, right? In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. What does that mean? Being a good example in doctrine, Right in what you know, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Sound speech, again, that cannot be condemned, that he is of the contrary part, may be ashamed having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things. So this is talking about how, how you ought to be as an employee. You know, we don't really have servants and masters now, but we have, you know, you're like a full-time servant in a sense, 40 hours a week. Um, this, you can take these verses... To, to understand how what sort of employee should, you should be. Not purloining, so that's, that's stealing, right? But showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. So just like salt can make things taste better, you know, us being salty salt in the world, we ought to make the world a better place and we would make the world a better place if we have salt in ourselves and truth in ourselves. The Bible also talks about when salt loses its savor. This is a sad thing when Christians are the salt of the earth, right? We are, you know, that's the ingredient in the earth that is making the earth a better place. But if the salt loses its savor, if Christians do not be what they have called to be, this is why the world is the way it is, you know, first and foremost. You know, we, don't, we, don't, we shouldn't expect the unbelieving world to improve this country, improve this world. You know, the responsibility lies on the salt of the earth, right, to add this flavor into the world. But if Christians don't do what they're called to be, then the world is not going to taste as good as it should, right? Do we expect unbelievers to do what we are called to do? We shouldn't, right? They need to get saved first and foremost before they can be salt of the earth but it says a year the salt of the earth but if the salt have lost his savor wherewith shall it be salted 
it is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Good for nothing. You know, I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't want to face God and have God tell me that I was good for nothing. You know what I mean? Like maybe I, I'd be saved. Maybe I'm in the kingdom. But then to be good for nothing. I mean, I would rather God look down at us and say that we were good for something. Right? So we need to have salt in ourselves so that we're not good for nothing. Look at how it explains it in Luke 14. It uses some quite strong words here. It says, salt is good, but if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? Look at this. It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill. So you see how the salt is so useless that it's not even useful to be put on a pile of dung, right? That's how useless we are if we do not have salt in ourselves. So that ought to motivate us to make sure that we are, you know, salty Christians. But men, cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So what are ways that we can be salty Christians? Some, some practical applications of how we get more salt within ourselves. Ephesians 3, look at what it says here, um, what Paul writes. He says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in few words. So he's talking about the revelations that he received from Jesus Christ. But look at how he says, this is how you are going to know those revelations. Whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his, unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So how do we get salt within ourselves? Well, first and foremost, you've got you to know your Bible. you just got to read your Bible. right? And he says here, you'll know what Paul knew when you read, you may understand the knowledge that he had in the mystery of Christ. So you read your Bible. That's how you're going to know and get that salt in you. You know, this is why Jesus says in Matthew 12, look at what he says to the, um, to the Pharisees here. He says, At that time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. When the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. So they're accusing them of doing something wrong. Look at what, how he responds to them. He said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was in hunger and they that were with him? And that's often the, the thought I have when you, you talk to Christians and they say things and you're like, haven't you read this in the Bible? Do you not know that this is in the Bible? And you know, a lot of Christians don't know what is in their own Bible, right? Because they're not reading it and therefore they don't know. They don't have that salt in them. He said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was an hungered, and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them that were with him, but only for the priests? Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. So this goes back to like what Jesus said in that verse we saw previously in Matthew 22, 29, where he says, you do err not knowing the Scriptures, right? Nor the power of God. So the easiest way we get salt in ourselves is we just read and learn it from the Bible, right? So obviously you can just read the paper Bible. But, you know, sometimes it helps to maybe listen to the Bible. If you, know, if, you, if you find it's harder for you to just read words on a page and read the Bible, then you can always, always buy an audio Bible, right? You know, Alexander Scorby, Scorby makes a really good audio Bible, and then you can listen to it. And sometimes people, people learn different ways. Sometimes people learn better just reading it on a page. You know, me personally, it was a lot easier for me to read the Bible once it had been read to me. And it, it just the, the familiarity of hearing it, you know, and you hear those verses, and then when you read it, you don't have to figure like how to read it to yourself. You kind of have heard it before, so then when you read over it, it helps you a lot easier to understand and focus on the words that are being said rather than figuring out how this thing should be said. So sometimes that helps people. You know, listen, obviously listening to sermons helps you as well. Uh, but you want to you want to really take care that you know sermons and other people's opinions are not your main source of truth. Why? Because how how do you discern? 
between what you're being taught is right or wrong, right? So you, you, you gain that discernment as you learn more about the Bible and you know the Bible yourself that you can then discern between what is true and what isn't, right? So a lot of new believers, they fall into that trap because obviously it's a lot easier, you know, as a baby, you start off being fed, right? You start off people making your meals, right? But then you know, as you get older, I mean, a lot of you are very health conscious, you know, as you get older, you, you start to think about what's in the food, and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So if you want to make sure, you know, your food is good food, you've got to know a bit about food, right? And how to prepare your own food, because what if it's not available to you, you need to make it at home. It's the same with the Bible, right? So don't be very careful of falling into that trap of thinking you're learning a lot about the Bible, but then all your information is coming from other people's opinions right? Your primary source of information should be you and the Holy Spirit in the Word, learning God's Word, and that's going to give you that wisdom and discernment to know what is true or what isn't. And, and you know, so other ways you can learn, you obviously can watch videos as well, that's other ways you can learn more. Um, but teaching to learn as well, you know, you want to get to the point where, you know, if you know enough about the Bible, you know, you want to start helping others to understand it. And that's why soul winning is very good. Soul winning is as a way that we're teaching unbelievers the Word of God, or even teaching other Christians that we meet out there the Word of God. And the more you try and explain, the more you try and teach, the better you get as well at learning and retaining that knowledge, putting that knowledge into practice. And this is what James 1 really, really, really addresses when it talks about being a doer of the Word and not just a hearer only. James 1.23, it says, If any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Right, so he's explaining here that if you hear the word of God, you know what you ought to be doing and you don't do it, you're going to forget it. Just like somebody who looks at themselves in the mirror and then immediately forgets what they look like. They don't do anything to correct what they saw. They forgot the image that they saw in that mirror. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not, a, look at this, a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So I think this is a very important point that if we don't do what we know, we forget what we know. And just because you're a Christian that's saved, you know, it's like the amount of salt in you can fluctuate, right? Because if you don't use the salt that is in you to be salt in the world, you will start to become less and less salty, right? Why? Because you will start to forget the things that you've learned. You know, for those of you who have been in this church for many years, I'm sure you've learned a lot being in this church. But, you know, I had to preach these things again and again because people forget, why? They forget because they are not maybe not doing it themselves. You know, they are not teaching it themselves. So we don't always retain all that information. So yes, we need to be reminded again and again and again. But you know what? You can retain that information if you put it into practice and um, you know, even teach it yourself. So that's salt. So salt, we've got some properties of salt and um, ways that we can be salty. It's just getting truth in us. Now let's talk about light, spiritual light. What does the light mean in the Bible? Well, light in Ephesians 5, it talks about light is anything that makes something known. Right? Ephesians 5.8, it says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. So we see here light is something that makes something known. It makes something manifest, right? And there are really like two ways that you know, we see here in this, is this passage of Scripture that, that light is manifested. One is, we can see here, it's when we reprove something. So it's, you know, we may be saying something that makes this truth known. It shines light on this truth. But it's also the way we act as well. 
And we'll see this in the Bible. You can see here, it's talking about don't have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Walk as children of light. So the way we, you know, the way we act is one way that we show this light in the world, but it's also the things we say. So we can see our actions and our words is how we are light in this world. And it obviously it's related to being the salt in the earth as well. So even though there are two different analogies, they are accomplishing the same goal, right? To be an influence in this world. Look at what it says here in Titus 1. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching. Right? So how is God's word made known in the world? Right? It's through preaching. It's spoken. Right? This is how the light shines into the world to know what God's word is, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. See, so we're light in the world, not just by how we live, but by the things we say as well. Sometimes people think it's just one or the other. Right? They think as long as they're telling everyone the truth and the truth is out, it doesn't matter how they, how they, um, how they act. You know, they say that they know the truth, they're preaching the gospel, but then how, how do we actually, how are we ambassadors for Jesus Christ? See, how you behave is also important too. Some people have it the other way around, right? Where they think it's just, oh, it's how I live, and if I live a certain way, then people are going to come to me and just ask, oh, what do you got? I want, and I want that too. You know, and that's how they think that, you know, we're going to preach the gospel. But you know what? The world doesn't want necessarily what, how Christians live. You know, because to them, it's, it's abhorrent, you know, like that we would, you know, give up our Sundays and come and, you know, sing to God and pray to God. These are things that once you're saved, that the Spirit wants. Yeah, see if you can fix that again, guys. I don't know. Uh, see, that's why they, that's why they got to, they got to be in church, because, you know, if you have technical difficulties, then they're going to miss out. So sometimes people have it the other way around. Sometimes people have it the other way around, where it's just, all about how they live, right? They think that's enough to be light. That's not enough, right? You need both. It's how you live and generally how you live is going to give a lot more credibility to the things you say. Matthew 5, it says here, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now what I think is so important here to understand that we are the light of the world, that this means, you know, the Bible says here that you don't light a candle and put it under a bushel, right? Christians are not called to live like an anonymous life where nobody knows that you're a Christian, nobody knows who you are. You know, that doesn't mean necessarily that you need to be a public figure and put yourself out there. But Sometimes people want to live a life where they just like live out in the middle of nowhere, off grid, away from everyone, where they just have peace and quiet. And I don't believe that is the sort of life that God has called us to live, right? You know, we may live further out, but we need to live a life that is engaged in society. I mean, you don't light a candle, like the Bible says, you don't light a candle and then put it under a bushel. You don't have somebody that's saved and is a child of God, is called to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ and then put that that light under a bushel, right? that light has to be in the world, giving light to the world. You put it on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men. Right? How do you let a light shine before men when nobody knows you even exist? Right? So this is why Christians are not called to live this life of just keeping to ourselves. Our, we are called to live a life to influence others and to be that light in the world, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You see, your good works are not meant to be hid under a bushel. They're meant to be seen uh, of others so that you can be that light. So, you know, people, not only do we speak the truth to bring that light into the world, but we live the truths of the Word of God so that people can see that light. So there should be a difference Right? between the way we live and the, and the sort of influence we have on society compared to how an ungodly person would live. You know, we look at the ungodly world and there's no difference between them and you. And that's a problem. Right? How are you being light when you're shining, you know, you're removing the same light that the ungodly people are removing? Right? So we want to be that light in the world. People ought to see a difference. And like I said, I don't believe Christians 
are called to live a life that is just totally separate from the world, right? Because how are we going to impact the world if we're not part of it? We need to be in the world, like the Bible says, but not of the world. Now, what are some other like properties of light? We sort of talked about it already, but one property of light is that it exposes. Look at John 3, uh, Jesus says here, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Jesus says here, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So you see that there are two sides to light. Like one thing is, if somebody wants to hide something, light exposes that. That's why wickedness does not want light shown on it. You know, wicked governments and wicked rulers don't want transparency because they don't want people to see what is going on, right? So light, you can see, it, it, it reveals things and obviously people that don't want to be revealed don't like the light. But you see the opposite is true as well, that people that are doing righteousness are often comforted by the light. I mean, think about when you, you know, if you go into a dark place and there's no street lamps, but there's street lamps turned on, it will instantly provide some comfort because now you can see things that are going on around you. So it's the same with light, right? It is the spiritual light. Spiritual light can expose things that are wrong as people reprove them and rebuke them. But at the same time, light can be comforting because now think about how it works in a spiritual context. If one person puts themselves on a candlestick and shines brightly, it gives comfort for other people to maybe do the same. You know, this is why the more Christians that shine as bright lights, the more other Christians may be given the boldness and the comfort to do the same, right? So light has that effect. Not only that, but, you know, the Bible says in Psalm 119, 105, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know, I sometimes think of this in terms of light and sharing truth with others and, 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 and being an example. Light helps to show a clear way and also guides people. And you know, sometimes, you, you, you know, it's always good to have somebody to look up to as a mentor or as a follower. Ultimately, everyone's following Jesus Christ. But, you know, the Bible says, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. So we have lights in the world that are, you know, reflecting, showing the light of Jesus Christ. And it gives us that guidance, not only in maybe counsel and, and having a question and going, well, what should I do here? And then having the wisdom and the counsel and the light in us to be able to help somebody else, but also the way we act, it can show people, ah, like this is, this is what you know, it's like to have a, a, a good family. This is what it's like to raise our children. This is what it's like to live a Christian life. That also gives us some guidance as well and some comfort. And, you know, and, and like I said, it shows the difference between living a good life, Christian life, and an ungodly life. So let's finish off just like talking about, you know, just some practical ways to be light, you know, how to shine bright for the Lord. Mark 4, he said unto them, is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a candle or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick? So like I talked about, you know, our, our purpose is not to be hidden. God wants us to be put on a candlestick. That's the purpose he has for us. Will we, will we rise to that occasion? Will we rise to that calling? So don't hide be seen, you know, don't, don't be worried about people knowing that you're a Christian, that you're a believer. Uh, and usually it's a lot easier, you know, it's a lot easier to just be open about who you are than hiding who you are, right? Like if you, it's like if at work, if people just know you're a Christian, if people just know you go to church, then it, it's, I always, always found it's just, it's just less, less weird, right? But if you, you try and hide it, it's always more awkward. So if you just, you know, break that ice, it's, it's, it's easier just being who you are right, than trying to try and fit in. So don't hide, be seen. You never know like who you might affect, right, in your life. Um, look at Luke 8, verse 16. It says, No man, when he had lighted a candle, cover it with a vessel, put it under a bed, but, it's, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. I think, it's, I think it's interesting that, you know, we are lights of the world, but, you know, it talks about this candle put on a candlestick. It must be lit, and, you know, obviously that could may refer to salvation, but sometimes I think about, you know, getting people moving. 
It's like what's going to light a fire under you to get you lit, you know, and, and get you doing something for the Lord, you know. And if, if it's not, you know, Jesus Christ dying on the cross for you and everything he provides for you, maybe you need to reflect on that a bit more so that that love that God has shown to you, you will respond to. But this, this candle has to be lit and, you know, this is why I think, you know, some practical ways is, you know, have some fire in you, have some zeal, some passion in the things of God. Uh, other ways that we can be light in the world, obviously we can preach the gospel. That's what we're going to do this afternoon. Go out, tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ and be that light. And, you know, I, I, I've probably lost count of the amount of times that, you know, you may not necessarily get somebody saved at the door, but just explaining further concepts to them to help them understand the things of God, right? And help them to understand salvation. So that's how we are light in the world. You know, maybe it's undoing misconceptions, you know, that's a way you can shine light into people's life. Is they, maybe they have this darkness of this misconception that is clouding them from this light and you help to remove those barriers of misconception. Um, what about social media? You know, social media, not, you know, not everyone maybe has the talent or the ability to run like a successful YouTube channel or successful social media page, but we all have different ways we can use our public presence in order to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And if you have that ability to run those sort of pages and do that, why not do that to help get more information out? Be that light in the world for something of good. I always talk about, you know, and you guys know that I, I feel strongly about, you know, being politically involved. You know, and the reason why I, I always hark on this, and it's not so much a problem in our church uh, nowadays, but, you know, there, there are always the Christians out there, and I think it's so unfortunate, that believe that Christians should not be involved in politics, right? And what is politics? P politics is just the, how decisions are made in a society, right? Now, if we in a democratic society are given the ability to take part in that process, and we are called to be salt and light in the world, how can we say we shouldn't take part in that process? I mean, this is direct influence on how laws are made and how decisions are made and how the, the, how the country and the state and the local governments are governed. I mean, surely if anything, Christians should be in that place. And it just boggles my mind that there are still Christians today thinking that Christians should have nothing to do with that, right? And, and I, I use, sort of use the analogy just to simplify to think, oh, well, should Christians be involved in politics? I mean, if there was a vote tomorrow, on whether abortion should be legal or not, like whether you can kill a baby in the womb, and all we had to do is go and vote yes or no. I mean, surely you would think Christians should go out there and fill out that piece of paper and vote yes or no, right? And any Christian that's saying, oh, you know, don't go and write that piece of paper, don't, don't take part in the, in the beast system, and they talk things like that, oh, your vote's not gonna make a difference anyway, or they'll say, you know, whatever they say, it's for you to not just go and partake in that system to at least influence it in the right direction. I mean, I just feel like that it would be so wicked, right? That'd be like people like they, they didn't fill out that postal vote for the same-sex marriage thing. And now we've got same-sex marriage in Australia, even though that, you know, it was a postal vote and it was voluntary and everything. But you just think like, I wonder how many Christians didn't fill out that piece of paper that may have made the difference between it being legal now and not being legal. So... You know, like for the political process is no different to that analogy. It's just to a greater degree. Instead of choosing on one certain issue, you're choosing, you know, the governors of the country. So I just don't know how people argue against it. It just boggles my mind. But, you know, I know they have all their reasons. But uh, I just think they're completely uh, unreasonable in my mind. But politics is just a way that we are influencing how decisions are made in our country. That's all politics is. And, and we should be involved there in any way that we can to sway the, those results. But, you know, another way that you may not have thought, because we're obviously thinking about all these big ideas, but, you know, sometimes I think being light in the world sometimes is just, you know, just being friendly to other people. You know, there's enough negativity in the world and, you know, all that. But, you know, and sometimes I think, you know, in, in, especially in this technological day we live in, and maybe it's not technology that has changed, it's just human nature in general. Because you know how people say, you know, you see those memes on Facebook or whatnot where they say, oh, you know, the phones have made people antisocial. And then they show those olden day pictures where everyone's just, their faces just in the newspaper. <laughs> so maybe just antisocial behavior is just human nature. But I think like as Christians, you know, we shouldn't be like that. 
you know, as Christians, if you're out somewhere with other people that you don't know, you know, maybe don't just have your face stuck in your phone and just ignoring everyone around you. You know, why don't you, why don't you when you sit next to, like maybe when you take your kids out or you're at something and you sit next to somebody that you don't know, like say hello. You know, maybe it's not necessarily that you, you know, let's say, you know, maybe you don't have the boldness yet to just like preach the gospel to them or whatnot, but, you know, it may lead to that. But even at the very least, guys, like let's just be friendly with people. You know, that's one way that we change culture, change society. Like, you know, like people say they go to a country and they say, oh, that country was so friendly. But how did they, how did they get that impression? It was probably just because the neighbor said hello to them. The neighbor was friendly. The person they, they sat next to on the bus just said hello, struck up a conversation. You know, they went to an event and the dad that was next to them just introduced themselves. Hey, I, that's, how it, that's how perceptions are created. So think about how, how are the perceptions of Christians created? You know, wouldn't it be great if people at least, you know, kept that perception that Christians were godly people, respectful people, people that didn't swear all the time. And people that, you know, when you sat next to them, they said hello. They said, hello, my name's Victor, you know. How long have you been going here? Struck up a conversation. Like, you know, that is one way that we can be light to the world, just to be f friendly and, you know, give people a smile and, and, and talk to them and, and not go down this ungodly route of just eyes down in your phone on social media like everyone is doing today. So... Think about that, guys. You know, don't, don't just go somewhere. I know it's a lot easier to be antisocial, right? It's a lot easier to just be in your own world, just ignore everyone else. But let's not create that kind of culture. You know, I'd rather live in a world where people were friendly and spoke to one another, where, you know, nowadays, you know, I go there, and if you do that, you're the one that's different. People notice, like, oh, this person's, like, saying hello, introducing themselves. But, you know, everyone else just sits there and just their phone, their face is in their phone. Let's not, let's not lose that as, you know, just being a friendly face to others, okay? So, Matthew 5, he has a salt of the earth. If the salt had lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill, cannot be hid. Right, so notice that it doesn't say that you will become salt, you will become light. Right? So it's not that we are Christians and we are called to be salt and be light. We are salt. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light. You already are that. Right? So the question is more so, will you be what God has called you to be? Right? Because whether or not we do it or not, that, that's, we're, the, we're like the only hope <laughs> of the earth to be the salt and the light. So... Be what God has called you to be. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, Lord, thank you for the reminder that we are to be salt and light in this world. Lord, help us to be that. It's not easy. It's a lot easier just to go away from this responsibility and just, um, you know, be in our own, um, you know, just not, you know, not do this. So, Lord, we need your grace. We need your courage. Lord, give it to each and every believer so that we can make the difference in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.